Hello, everybody. Um, oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> Glad someone's listening. Uh, I'm Gary Gerstel, the Mellon Professor of American History here at Cambridge. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session, the last session of a conference that has been going on since yesterday, called Writing American History in Uncertain Times. Uh, we are live streaming this event, and so hello to all of you who are on Zoom. I assume that you can see me. I can't see you, but I think, Nick, you can see if they are, in fact, able to see me. And I'll have a few words to say uh, about how to ask questions at the conclusion of my introductory remarks. A few thanks are in order first. Uh, first to Nick Ayat, a professor of North American history uh, here at Cambridge and a fellow of Jesus College. Nick is sitting right here in case anyone, uh, anyone here does not know him. He is the principal organizer, mover, and shaker uh, of this conference. He has done an extraordinary job. It's been all on his shoulders, uh, and uh, he's brought many people from the U.S. He's, this is a conference that's been three and a half years in the making and delayed repeatedly because of the pandemic and the difficulty of transatlantic travel. So we are really thrilled to be able to pull this off. And the occasion for this conference is, uh, is the forthcoming illustrated Oxford Illustrated History of U.S. History uh, that Nick is editing, uh, and most of the contributors to that volume have been brought over from the United States for this conference. And do you have any idea yet when that book will, in fact, be published? Early next year. Early 2024, mm -hmm. we're talking about. In time for the election. In time for the election, so uh, much to look forward to. I want to thank Jesus College for uh, all the facilities that they have provided and for the opportunity to be in this wonderful room, the Frankopan room, uh, and also for all the logistical information that they have provided to us. And last but not least, the many contributors to the Oxford Illustrated History of the U.S. who have made a long trek, trek for this occasion. We thank you so much for coming and being here uh, with us. As I said yesterday, for those of you who were here yesterday, um, and don't worry for those of you who were here yesterday, I'll be brief reviewing what I said yesterday. Uh, a for a long time, for 20 years, historians were bemoaning their irrelevance in America, the loss of a public guiding voice about the nation's past uh, and its relevance to America's present and future. I can't tell you how many uh, laments were uttered and printed, especially in the 1990s and early uh, years of the 21st century, about the once prominent voice that American historians had in America now being lost. And these stories have stopped. How much things have changed. And let us not forget in this moment of turmoil in our profession, in our, in, and in our institution, institutions, how relevant American history has become, how urgent the lessons from the past are now deemed to be, what a difference decades of dogged creative work in the history of slavery, race, indigeneity, gender, and sexuality has made. However much doom and gloom pervade the consciousness of the current moment, and for those of you who were here yesterday, you, you know I was complaining about the doom and gloom being expressed at this conference about the difficulties of the current moment. How, however much doom and gloom pervade the consciousness of this current moment, can there be any doubt that the social history revolution that began in the 1970s, writing the history from below, from the bottom up, recovering the history of the anonymous, allowing the subaltern to speak, is there any doubt that that revolution, 50 years in the making now, has been an outstanding success. I can say this with authority, not because of my position as Mellon professor, but because of my age. Just to see if you're all alive. <laughs> I see four smiles in, in the room here. I was there at the beginning. When I entered graduate school in the 1970s, uh, what we then called social history did not exist. Now it is inescapable. In today's parlance, I was a first gen of social history, actually 1.5 gen to be precise. 
half a generation behind the Linda Gordons, Gary Nashes, Ira Berlins, Linda Kerbers, Nancy Cotts, Herbert Gutmans, Barbara Fields, Vin Deloria's, and David Montgomery's and others of the world who lit our way. For a long time, there was doubt that this work would penetrate beyond the academy, and it took decades, but now it has. The 1619 Project, statutes falling, the names of Confederates and Army bases being removed, institutions being compelled to scrutinize their own history, histories vis-a-vis -vis slavery and the slave trade, our students, our students challenges, challenging us all the time to open up, rework, and rethink our curricula. In these circumstances, is there any surprise that this movement has engendered resistance? How could it not? The conflicts are intense, they are consequential, they are going on as we speak. Which brings us to the topic of today's session, writing American history in uncertain times. We have asked the panelists to take a measure of the struggles that have broken out over the writing and teaching of American history to offer us dispatches from their front lines. What has their experience been in their own institutions? What are the institutional implications of the struggles in which they are engaged? What are the personal implications, especially in terms of writing history about ideas and themes denounced as woke? Where do we go from here? And finally, looking ahead to 2026, the 250th anniversary of one of the most important documents ever produced in American history, the Declaration of Independence, declaring that all men are created equal. On that anniversary, in three years, will Americans still be able to find common ground and a shared understanding of their past? The feelings on these matters run strong. Arguments are welcome, but arguments must be accompanied here. I want to ask for civility and respect if any disagreements occur. It's in that spirit that I hope we can let this conversation go forward today. We have, uh, fortunately, four excellent speakers. And I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly, my apologies, but they had long introductions yesterday and I'm eager for them to get to their presentations and then to the conversation that, um, that it will elicit. So I ask their forgiveness for introducing them with one sentence or two, um, but I feel it's the way to go. And the order in which I introduce them are the order in which they are sitting and in the, the order in which they will speak. Eric Rauschway, University of California, Davis, a distinguished historian of the New Deal and chair until recently of the Committee on Academic Freedom at the University of California. Honor Sachs, a major historian of slavery, law, family, and gender in 18th century America. Honor teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder. Kareen Walther, a key historian of the US and the Islamic world in the 19th and 20th century centuries. Kareen teaches at Georgetown University in Cotter. And finally, Nathan Connolly, an indispensable historian of political, of political economy and race in the second half of the 20th century. Nathan teaches at Johns Hopkins. Let me point out that two of the panelists work at state institutions, public institutions, Eric and Honor and thus are subject to the authority of state legislatures in terms of the larger remit under which they work. And two of our uh, panelists, Kareen and Nathan, work at private institutions where they are subject to the authority of their universities, but not of the government itself, uh, unless the Cotter government has something to say about what can be said or not in uh, Georgetown uh, in that country. Uh, I've asked each of them to speak for 10 minutes. I've asked them to limit their initial comments to 10 minutes so that we can have as much time for conversation as possible. To those of you on Zoom, uh, please use the Zoom. When we get to the Q&A 
If you want to ask a question, uh, please uh, use the Zoom mechanism to raise your hand. And we have Nick Guyatt sitting here who is going to monitor any questions that come in on Zoom and will relay them to me. So we hope that those of you who are on Zoom can become active participants in this discussion. Uh, anything else, Nick, that I have forgotten? The Q&A function on Zoom that they're going to use. They can post questions whenever they like. They don't need to raise their hand. Oh, don't raise your hand. Use the Q&A function. Nick will see them. Yeah, I'll see them on the And he'll relay them uh, to me so that we can uh, put them into conversation. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and we're going to ask people, at least for their initial comments, to speak from the podium. Okay. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Gary, Nick, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Gary mentioned, I teach at the University of California, Davis, which means I am an employee of the state of California. That does put me under a slightly different regime than those of my colleagues who work at private universities. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, not only are all uh, state university uh, instructors in, this, in the United States covered by the First Amendment, unlike uh, our colleagues at uh, um, private universities, but also the University of California has one of the strongest and longest standing uh, policies for protecting academic freedom. Unlike many of my colleagues, I am even protected in what I may say disparagingly about the administrators at my own institution, which is a broad remit for academic freedom uh, indeed. However, as Gary points out, I have been uh, chair uh, for some time of the UC-wide um, Committee on Academic Freedom and now am co-chairing the similar committee for the Organization of American Historians, uh, which has remit to look after those of us who teach American <laughs> history. And in that capacity, I've of course been increasingly asked to um, outline and consider possible responses to the wave of new legislation uh, in which my home state of Florida is leading the way to attempt to restrict uh, what can be taught in classrooms, particularly though not exclusively with respect to United States history. At this point, more than 20 U.S. state legislatures have either passed or are drafting uh, statutory restrictions on teachers, school libraries, and university professors of history and related social sciences intended to prevent or to limit teaching about race, gender, and sexuality. Often such laws go along with efforts to stop uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI programs, and also to end tenure for uh, university faculty. This is only an extreme instance, but it is an extreme instance, of a long-standing trend. As historians, we know that the premise for these laws, that history classrooms in particular, are engines of subversive indoctrination, has been developed by conservatives in the United States for over a century. It goes back at least to the time when Warren Harding's newspaper uh, reviewed Charles Beard's 1913 an economic interpretation of the Constitution with a review headlined, Scavengers Desecrate the Graves of Dead Patriots We Revere. <laughs> Moreover, it's been consciously adopted as a strategy by the Republican Party since the New Deal to emphasize the disloyalty and the subversive possibilities of various aspects of the culture. Herbert Hoover uh, in 1934 noted that Republicans probably could not win elections based on economic issues. But, he said, enough voters could probably be divorced from that majority on the basis of religious beliefs to make the difference in elections. In other words, Hoover, in many things, uh, in this as in many things, was a pioneer of the idea that changing the conversation from the material welfare of the majority of Americans to what we now sometimes call the culture wars or the history wars would give the Republicans an advantage they could not otherwise have. So this is very much a conscious strategy of mobilization. And again, the latest version of it that is very much in that vein. Uh, the most recent iteration of this uh, was that developed to, con uh, to counter the influence of Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, activists and politicians launched a counteroffensive against, quote, critical race theory, unquote, a real thing that was expanded to cover a multitude of other uh, instances of teaching the history of race in the United States. This was led by the journalist turned political strategist Christopher Rufo, who inspired 
Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, among others, and Rufo helped to write a series of bills for a series of state legislatures. So we can fairly well trace the genealogy of this idea in its, in its latest form. Rufo is now a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, the New York City-based uh, conservative think tank, uh, and continues to work closely with the DeSantis administration uh, in the state of Florida, particularly in what Rufo calls its top-down restructuring of New College Florida, which is the public liberal arts college in the city of Sarasota in Florida. The legislation that Florida has enacted in uh, sort of this vein uh, is relatively well known. The uh, extremely well known so-called don't say gay law of 2022 bars teaching sexuality wherever it isn't age appropriate uh, in the Florida's public schools. Uh, that's still on the books, right? This statute and other policies like it shapes instruction and library holdings throughout the state for the most part by well-intentioned uh, school librarians who simply don't want to get into trouble with their school districts or with the state's governorship. The uh, um, even more wonderfully uh, and properly titled, well, the actual title of this law is the Individual Freedom Act of 2022, but it's better known by DeSantis's preferred name, Stop Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees, which of course is abbreviated as Stop Woke uh, Act, bars instruction or training in a series of concepts. These include the concept that anyone might be either privileged or bias, consciously or unconsciously, because of their race, and that no student in a Florida public classroom should be made to feel responsibility, guilt, anguish, or other forms of psychological distress for the actions of anyone in the past who belong to the same race as they do. This law has been enjoined by a federal judge just this March because it is blatantly antithetical to the United States Constitution. It does, however, remain in place, and its, its future remains as yet uncertain. In my capacity as co-chair of the Organization of American Historians uh, uh, Committee on Academic Freedom, one of the things we do is try to convene uh, suitable forums at the annual meeting of the OAH, so that for the next spring that we decided we wanted to do one uh, that had to do with the situation in the state of Florida, specifically by talking to people who were, as Gary says, on the front lines there. So it was my job to uh, make some telephone calls to people in Florida universities who would probably want to come to the OAH meeting because of their scholarly interests and see if they wouldn't also serve on this panel and discuss their own experiences. And I, you know, happy ending, I ended up getting four, uh, four yeses. But I can tell you it was not an easy job. First of all, uh, I say telephoned advisedly uh, because nobody really wanted to have a, an email exchange on this uh, subject uh, because Florida has a laudably strong uh, Public Records Act, but it can be used, of course, to monitor preemptively the emails of state employees, including professors in uh, history departments. Um, the range of responses I got went from actually it doesn't affect me directly, I still have tenure, I can pursue my research as I please, to thank you for not emailing me about this because I know my email is being monitored, I am not being paranoid, excerpts from my emails have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, to uh, I am leaving the academy at the end of this year and do not wish to speak about it. Right, so there's quite a range of experiences that Florida instructors of American history have because of this law, which again is not actually enforced, right, but creates what is well known as a chilling effect uh, in, the, in the academy where trustees, where administrators choose not to be profiles in courage and do not speak out against these, uh, again, I think it's fair to say I am not a lawyer, but obviously unconstitutional laws. Um, there are well-established constitutional bases for academic freedom in U.S. law, right? In the well-known case of Sweezy versus uh, New Hampshire, Justice Felix Frankfurter noted the, dependence, noted the dependence of a free society on free universities and said that this means the exclusion of governmental intervention in the life of the university, right? It is the business of a university to provide that atmosphere which is most conducive to speculation, experiment, and creation. It is an atmosphere in which there prevail the four essential freedoms 
a phrase carefully chosen in the wake, of course, of the Roosevelt administration leading the Allies in a fight for the four freedoms against the Nazi uh, uh, menace, as uh, Winston Churchill would have said. It is an atmosphere in which there must prevail the four essential freedoms of a university to determine for itself on academic grounds who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study. As I say, this is fairly clear and established Supreme Court law. Uh, of course, we have a new Supreme Court since Justice Frankfurter sat on it, and so we don't know uh, how it might rule should, should uh, such a case reach it. It's worth noting that most Americans, when polled, will agree with the Frankfurter principle, will, if asked, agree that they think the government ought to stay out of university classrooms in particular and classrooms more generally. That polling will change, though, if you ask people, do you think the government should intervene where teachers are indoctrinating students? Or if you think the government should intervene where you think teachers are using divisive concepts. Race is an unspoken but implicitly considered to be a divisive concept uh, in this context. Given this sort of fragile state of public opinion and the current forward march in this legislative effort to restrict academic freedom, I think it is most incumbent on organizations like uh, the one to which I belong and those to which the rest of us belong, to remind the public for history of the professional process by which we decide those vital uh, freedoms for instance, university. Who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall be taught, and who may be admitted to study, right? The First Amendment alone is not the basis for academic freedom. It is that group professional process by determining who is competent to teach and how these processes are taught. To understand that they are not uh, instruments of indoctrination, as many of my colleagues have noted before me, but I will remind you, if I could indoctrinate the students, I would indoctrinate them to read the syllabus. Um, <laughs> to remind them of the process by which curriculums get established and by which institutions like slavery, their history and their legacy, earn a central place in the study of United States history. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I apologize for my gravelly voice. I'm getting a little bit of a cold. Um, I, this morning, we had the wonderful opportunity to get together with um, a group of graduate students. Um, it was delightful. The graduate students in this program have been a really crucial and critical and, and um, welcome part of this, this, uh, this um, event this week. And so in many ways, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I had them very much in mind. Um, I wanted to speak to the graduate students because as um, the future historians um, living and being um, sort of uh, saturated by this political context, I felt like they might need a little bit of a boost. Um, so the charge today right, was to talk about writing history in uncertain times. This, of course, led me to question what that even means, right? What are certain times? Historians are in the business of thinking about the past, so why should we have any sense of certainty at all about what might come in the future? This is not where we traffic. <clears throat> Although we can project possibilities based on past patterns, we can never really know what's coming, hashtag pandemic. Um, so why is this moment different from anything that we've ever lived through before. What is, what is so particularly uncertain about this moment? I mean, when we consider the terms, like, right, I'm a historian, let's define our terms. Um, when we consider some of the terms that we've thrown about so often this week, you know, we've spent a lot of time referring to the language of our, polit our current political moment and all the things that the word woke has come to represent. Woke, however, as a concept, is kind of a mystery. Um, my mother, bless her heart, um, had to finally ask me sheepishly, as she does all things 
hurting history and politics, she said, she had to ask me to define what woke actually means. Um, she asked because her um, news, my, her brother, my Newsmax watching uncle who lives in Surprise, Arizona, such a cliche, um, <laughs> would talk to her on and on and on about the woke mob, the woke, the woke this, the woke left, and she didn't know what it meant. So I had to explain to my mom that, you know, that woke in many ways is a, is a word, is a, is a um, term that has meaning largely to the American political right, that people on the left don't often use it other than to sort of brace themselves against um, um, attacks uh, with, with that word. It's a word in many ways that's been weaponized um, by the media to sort of mock um, a liberal agenda and liberal ideas. But the weaponization of the word woke is actually part of a much longer story by which the right has very effectively co-opted left-leaning ideas in order to demonize and minimize a liberal agenda. I mean, I'm sure this has a, you know, just thinking back into my own, my own lifetime, I mean, I remember when, you know, Bush won, um, accused Michael Dukakis in the 80s uh, about being a, a card-carrying liberal, right? Um, transforming the word liberal into a political liability from which Dukakis never recovered. Um, you, you know, during the 1990s, uh, if you recall, Rush Limbaugh decided to go after feminists, right? And he coined the term feminazi, from which, you know, an entire generation of women was alienated from the political um, uh, work of feminism. You know, and as somebody who entered graduate school in a, a women's history program in the late 90s, I had to encounter a whole generation of young people who thought that feminism was a bad word. In the 2000s, you recall that Glenn Beck was at war with the term progressive, right? Everything was about the progressives. And he reached back into the most unseemly parts of the progressive era, of which there were many, in order to launch attacks on the contemporary left. And you know, today, you know, in the in the you know last ten years or so, the language uh, of attack during the Trump years kind of became a word salad, right? Of all things, you know, liberal, socialist, Democrat, communist, everything. Um, but now the word woke seems to be ascendant and seems to be a catch-all for this, you know, that fits into this larger pattern. So this stuff has a history. This language has a history, <clears throat> and you know. So you know, if patterns, these patterns of, of political wordsmithing are not new, then what makes these times more uncertain than any other? Right? Are we being hysterical? The short answer is, I think, no. We are not being hysterical, and I think historians today, in many ways, are feeling the weight of this pre present moment, in particular and in somewhat unexpected ways. I don't think that any of us expected that history, the teaching of history, or the public memorialization of history would become such a lightning rod in our political landscape. I mean, I recognize that history has always been controversial in some way or another, but the ubiquity of history in so much of our political, uh, current political dialogue is staggering. I mean, from the explosive battles at school board meetings over the teaching of history, um, the rejection of African American studies curriculums, the censoring of queer history, the panic over criti critical race theory in schools, the purging of library books, the rewriting, no more than the rewriting, the legislation of historical standards the, you know, by politicians who are determining what uh, history is appropriate history. Um, I think we can think about the, the sloppy uses of history in um, recent Supreme Court decisions the hysteria over the 1619 projects and the other projects that emerged in response, the sort of weird short-lived 1620 response. There was the 1776 commission, which is a fascinating document. Um, the 1836 project that was legislated in Texas. You know, not to mention all these attacks on tenure, the closing of history departments, the defunding of the humanities, on and on and on. So yes, I think historians are, are, are very much living in uncertain times, and it is all very grim. So what are we to do? The answer to this question, I think, you know, in, in answering this question, I want to address something that came up yesterday in the session. Um, it was a question from a graduate student um, that, that I have been thinking about ever since. 
it was a graduate student that asked uh, in, such a, in such an anguished way, what are we supposed to do? What are we people who live on the margins of, uh, who, who, are, who are in the crosshairs of these political attacks? Those of us who are queer, who are, um, who, who live, who live, who are trans, who are black, who are of any sort of, you know, group that, that is, 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 is being tossed into the sort of political fire. What are we to do about this? And, and the, the sense of, of, fear and anxiety in this question was so palpable that I think we really need to linger on this a little bit to, to address it um, and, to, and to really take it seriously. The answer to, this, to her, her question, what do we do, right, is unequivocally not to say, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Right? Things will work out. We don't know that. And you know, when we're sending graduate students out into a world in, in, in which the very skin that they inhabit, the very people you love, the subjects you are care, care about are being threatened, right? say, don't worry about it, It'll, you'll be fine, is really cold comfort. So there are, I think, a few ways that historians have, have, can, can meet this historical moment. One way that we've seen um, you know, a sort of a golden age emerge uh, uh, is, is engaging with the public, is using our historical knowledge to engage with the public. For, for you know, almost 10 years now, historians have been doing this very well. There are some big figures who are really vocal in this, in this, um, in this project. Kevin Cruz, Heather Cox Richardson, Joanne Freeman. I used to do much of this myself, right? Writing op-eds, publishing in you know, mass market uh, media. This is all very important work. I've, I in some ways, sort of bowed out of this, and I'll say more about this in a moment, um, because doing this t is risky, right? The people who are doing this and doing this quite well and prolifically are senior, full professors with tenure at, at institutions where they don't have to necessarily worry about sticking their necks out. Um, I wouldn't necessarily tell all graduate students to do this. In the, um, and, and at the same time, I also consider the words of, of uh, Taya Miles, who a couple of years ago wrote an op-ed su suggesting that, you know, maybe we don't need so many words. Maybe another statement is not what the world needs right now. Maybe what we need is to get out in the streets and start marching and start, you know, more, more you know, active political lobbying, more organizing and less, um, and less paper. So that's one way, is to engage with the public, use your historical, mobilize your historical knowledge um, to combat these sorts of, of uh, fake news, false narratives. But the other way, and this is what I was telling this graduate student yesterday, um, is to really commit yourself to your own research, um, to lean into what brings you joy, to not be afraid to study the hard subjects. Do research that you love and care about, um, and it will serve you. I have sat recently on a, a workshop for a, a dissertation to book um, a manuscript project, and I, I went through and I, could, I just told this person, I could tell every single part of every single chapter that you were writing for somebody else. And then I narrow down, these three paragraphs is where I could tell you fell in love, right? This is what you love, and this is magical writing, right? The stuff that you were writing for other people didn't, didn't move me. Stick with what you love. Lean, lean into that. Focus on what you think is important. To do otherwise will only deplete you. My personal journey, and I'll wrap up in, in, in a minute here, has, has been to sort of bow out of my social media presence. Um, not, so, not to bow out of my social media presence so much, but to, to really shift it. To stop using it as a place where I could fight back against false narratives, and instead use it as a place where I can project my own sources of joy um, to illustrate that, 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 uh, that uh, to use it as a place where I could project um, positivity into the world, um, where I could talk about the research that I care about, talk about what makes it important, use um, uh, this space as a place where I could where I can um, you know, bring some positive, positive um, to the world. Uh, in many ways, you know, my own work on people who are uh, under slavery, um, sued for freedom generation after generation after generation, gives me hope, right? And I like to write about narratives of hope, um, to quote in many, in, in closing, to sort of 
quote uh, one of my favorite political speeches of all time, um, and I always close my legal history course, which is a very grim and depressing cor uh, course, with my favorite political line from um, Harvey Milk. Uh, I always play for my students the gotta give them hope speech. He talks about you know, politically moving through the world in skin that is demonized in a political culture of hate. And he just says, the only way you get through this is to give them hope. And I'm hoping that that can uh, help some graduate students out there. So thank you. Um, I'm not sure I want to follow that. That was uh, very inspiring. Um, thank you to everyone for coming out today um, and for Nick and, and Gary for hosting us. So today I'm going to present on uh, my perspective as an American who was taught at Georgetown University in Qatar for the last 14 years. And before I begin, let me just provide a little bit of context on Georgetown. Um, Georgetown Qatar. It's been open for almost 20 years. I think we're celebrating <coughs> our 20th um, anniversary next year. And it's one of the five American branch campuses in Doha. Our students, who number only 450, are about 90% non-American, and about half of them are from the Middle East. And the other half come from all over the world. And in addition to the US History Survey course that I, I also teach a variety, a variety of courses on the United States' relationship with the world. Now, while I realize that the history wars are going on in the United States and they impact all of us as historians, um, and I've seen friends and fellow historians suffer the consequences of these history wars, in many ways living in Qatar, um, I've been personally lucky to avoid these issues, or this specific kind of history war, at least. <coughs> in my case, the history wars that I have to contend with are the legacies of US foreign policy, so including actual wars, and the impact that these have had on my students, their families, and the countries that they come from. And indeed, they never hesitate to remind me of this. I will always remember something a student said to me once, speaking about the United States. Your foreign policy is our domestic reality. These policies have shaped their vision of the United States in profound ways, something that we know is true of broader populations across the world. And here I'd like to quote from a poll conducted by the uh, Pew Global Attitudes Project from a few years ago, which found that, quote, anti-Americanism around the world was driven first and foremost by opposition to US foreign policy. According to the same study, quote, anti-Americanism in the Middle East is driven largely by aversion to US policies, such as the war in Iraq, the global war on terror, and US support for Israel in addition to the general perception that the US fails to consider the interests of countries in the region when it acts in the international arena. So the history wars that I've had to deal with are quite different from those in the United States, but in many ways they're just as fraught. I've had to try to explain the histories of American empire in the Philippines to Filipinos, US policies on Israel and Palestine to Palestinians, the global war on terror to Iraqis and women from Afghanistan, who especially recently came um, after America pulled out. The United States government's, government's use of drone warfare in the Middle East and South Asia. The Muslim ban, which prevented many of our students from uh, studying on main campus in DC. The January 6th insurrection. American rhetoric about China to our Chinese students. And of course, of course, the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. More recently, we've also discussed the growing number of laws that ban the teaching of certain topics in high schools and universities that my colleagues have already spoken about. And this has allowed us to discuss, in many ways, a comparative history of national mythologies and how they impact the history wars that occur in so many countries, even outside the United States. So while I have to address the very real repercussions American foreign policy has had on people in the nations my students come from, I should say that I think considering this factor would actually benefit professors who teach America in the world, in the United States and elsewhere. The history of US foreign relations abroad 
All right, that's a <laughs> goes beyond treaties and relations between diplomats. These policies and wars impact the lives of everyday people on a daily basis. And maybe students and professors in the United States would benefit from learning and teaching more about this. And this brings me to my final point on the history wars. The difficulty scholars have faced in teaching about Israel-Palestine and the laws that passed in the United States over a decade ago, limiting what professors can and cannot say in the classroom about this topic. These laws were in many ways the canaries in the coal mine to the current history wars and the current laws that have passed. At that point, these laws gathered little attention from the wider media or from scholarly organizations beyond those focused more specifically on the Middle East. These laws, however, have opened the path to challenge American history itself. And in this way, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that outlawing the impact of what Americans do to other peoples of the world in their foreign policies have now come to impact how we teach about the history of what Americans have done to their own people throughout its history. Um, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, Gary, you look great. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't think you were there at the beginning. <laughs> Just for me, I, I tend to go a little bit earlier. 19th century. Let's start there, maybe. In the wake of the Civil War, in the midst of Reconstruction and the Nadir, there was a very young um, and ambitious student by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois was on a junket to Germany to get a degree, a very elite doctoral degree from university in Berlin. And he was being funded by a foundation known as the Slater Fund. Some of you may know this story. Du Bois wrote a dissertation in German. Um, he finished all but one of his courses. And he wrote back to the then president of the Slater Fund, a man by the name of Daniel Coit Gilman, to get his funding renewed so that he could finish his one remaining course and get his PhD. This was in the 1890s, early 1890s. Gilman and the board at Slater determined that young Mr. Du Bois had, in fact, fulfilled the test that maybe they hadn't fully relayed to him about whether or not a young man of African descent could, in fact, complete the intense training that was going on at doctoral institutions in Germany, and that that question had then been answered by his performance, and he no longer needed to concern himself with getting the doctorate in Germany, that he instead needed to just finish up at a local backwater in Cambridge known as Harvard University. They denied Du Bois his funding and sent him on his way back to the US where he proceeded to get the Harvard PhD um, and destroyed the thesis written in German that no one has found. He then wrote the next year a short story lampooning uh, Johns Hopkins faculty that also very few people have read. Now the president of the Slater Fund was also the president of Johns Hopkins University, Daniel Coit Gilman. And one of Gilman's most important interlocutors at Hopkins is the namesake of the chair that I hold, Mr. Herbert Baxter Adams. Now, when we talk about the history wars, we have to talk about the Civil War and Reconstruction and how my institution, as a blueprint for the American Research University, might best be described as Reconciliation University. Because the point of the seminar at the first research university in North America was, in fact, to reunite the frayed relations between the gentlemen of the South and the North. They were to gather around the seminar table in Bar Baltimore, the borderland, and learn about their shared Teutonic, Anglo, and Nordic heritage. They were supposed to then go off and do research projects, and they were supposed to change the face of North America. Now, this is one of the things that I think is really important for our graduate students here to understand and appreciate, because I would not try to give cold comfort to the graduate students who are worried about the job market, but there was no job market relative to the academy in the 1880s. The point of the PhD 
was to go out into civil society and change the nation in the likeness of the heritage they had learned at the seminar table at Hopkins. And so students like Thomas Dixon, author of The Leopard Spots and The Klansman, students like Frederick Jackson Turner, students like Woodrow Wilson, gathered and figured out how they were supposed to refashion the nation in their own image. Herbert Baxter Adams, in fact, describes how the PhD is meant to be a fence picket, that if I stand next to yours and next to yours and next to yours, it protects our civilization from the savages on the outside. Each dissertation was supposed to serve its role. And through the power of the press, if you became an editor, if you became a judge, if you became head of the local antiquarian society, that PhD was going to give you the power to reshape the nation. That was the point of the PhD in the 1890s, in 1900. Doctoral education in North America, the professional historical profession, was not concerned with objectivity. They were concerned with what Adams called, quote unquote, history with a tendency. I find great inspiration in this, in fact, because I don't have to hand wring about whether or not we ought to be politically engaged in the present as scholars. That was actually the point in the beginning, without apology. And I think about the question of reconstruction, how dangerous reconstruction was to the modern research university because the research university ran off of philanthropy by and large. They didn't want to trouble themselves with too many federal requirements the way reconstruction was troubling about with public education and black self-determination and enfranchisement. All of that had to be written away scholastically, which it was thanks to Wilson and others, but also institutionally. And the research university served as the oppositional institution to the federal government relative to the conferral of rights. So young Mr. Du Bois was not going to have any recourse if Mr. Gilman told him, you can, in fact, finish your degree, because it fell to the donors to set the academic agenda. Now, I could go on and on about what cost Du Bois' disaffection leveled against Baltimore, because you could have had the Baltimore Negro instead of the Philadelphia Negro, for example. The fact that Du Bois owned a house in Baltimore deep into the 1940s, and as far as we know, never once stepped on the Hopkins campus, that he wrote about Hopkins in Black Reconstruction in his final chapter on propaganda and the dangers of its own revisionism. This was something he carried with him throughout his career. And yet through the 20th century, this concern about Reconstruction continued to drive the intellectual and political project of the historical profession. I want to be extraordinarily clear on this score. Entire fields subfields, disciplines emerge in direct response to and as a potential weapon against the concerns of federal enforcement, oftentimes on questions of racial and gender equality. Fast forward, the beginning, 1960s and early 70s. There's a small out of the way agency called the Department of Health, Education and Welfare in the United States. There's a young and very aggressive attorney who works for HEW by the name of Leon Panetta. He's 31 years old. He comes from California. He's part of a long forgotten group of anti-racist Republicans who worked within the federal government and saw in Richard Nixon's platform of law and order their marching orders to go after the Southern Democrats who they took to be their natural adversaries. Their job in the administration, and this is Panetta, this is Bob Finch, this is Donald Rumsfeld, this is Dick Cheney, this is George Romney, anti-racist Republicans who thought that the job of their agencies was to bring to heel people like John Stennis, Strom Thurmond, and so forth. Panetta and the HEW, and, and Bob Finch as its director, had impounded the funds from over 130 learning institutions, K through 12, state universities, and private universities that fell under the authority of the government. Columbia University had $70 million impounded in 1969 by HEW because there were no black people on faculty. That's all you had to do to snatch people's shit. <laughs> right? This was a very different moment. Now, in response to the concerns about federal enforcement, universities begin to scramble. How do we fill the ranks of our faculty and grad students with black people? We have to find them somewhere, otherwise we're going to lose our federal funds. Johns Hopkins University was the largest recipient of federal funds of any university in the country. So they very quickly gathered around the table and brilliant minds like Jack Green and David Cohen. People like Neville Dyson, who worked in Africa in the Department of Social Relations, Green the Americanist, Cohen the historian of Africa, Kenya. 
They got together and they formed a program. And the program in history, politics, and culture, excuse me, history, culture, and society, politics came later, was supposed to then find a on-ramp for faculty and students to enter into this all-white institution. First black faculty member, Ray Key, an Africanist from Ohio, black graduate students like Barry Gaspar, Brackett Williams, the great anthropologist Michelle Rolf Trouillot, who was a cab driver in New York, was discovered by Sidney Mintz, brought to Hopkins to get his PhD. Some of you may have heard of his work. These were all people who were brought into the university because the federal government was in a position to have leverage on the budgets of these institutions. Entire works in the field of what was called Atlantic Studies. Atlantic as a field did not exist prior to federal enforcement. It was history and it was anthropology, but as the 20th century's enforcement mechanism withered in the 1970s, the field of Atlantic history went from being decidedly decolonial with readings by Walter Rodney, Franz Fanon, Kamal Brathwaite, the great literary scholar, to a pro-imperial framing around Dutch history Spanish Empire, French Empire. What we see as Atlantic history today actually has an imperial character because by the time you got to 78, 79, 80, the federal government stepped back, the historical mandate of affirmative action was pulled out, and people began flushing from the institution those people who were normally going to be there under the aegis of federal protection. Now, why is this important? It's important because it reminds us that an enforcement mechanism is not a set of handcuffs. It's actually an engine for certain kinds of innovation and approaches. There are ways in which in this moment, um, it would probably be a week to 10 days before the entire DEI infrastructure as it exists in the US would be gutted by the Supreme Court. That's happening, you can just stay tuned, right? And so the question is what are we going to bring to bear on this moment? There's still a concern now about pissing off donors so, so much of these concerns about the history wars are also about good old-fashioned conflicts between capital and the state. Do we let the philanthropists set the agenda? Pulling names off of buildings is bad business if you want to incur donations. We had an entire committee within a committee within a committee to figure out what names were gonna stay and go. I actually served on the commission brought together by Princeton University to determine whether or not Woodrow Wilson's name should stay on the School of Public Policy. I was one of the 12. Academics brought in, wrote a very nice single space, two page letter. And they determined at that time they weren't going to do it because they didn't want to erase history. Students got together, they took another pass at the question, and they decided to ultimately pull it down. Hopkins were a little, little bit slower on the issue. He still has an undergraduate fellowship in his honor. But I just want to be clear that this concern about the place of capital in setting our questions is already politicizing our business, and we need to be aware of it as the enforcement mechanisms dissipate even further. And you have to be willing to make the kinds of curricular arguments, potentially political arguments, that will keep the control of the content in the hands of the scholars who are doing the work and the students who need it. I want to uh, make a last point here as I go to my seat. There was a great Baltimorean that we did have a chance to honor. Um, not Du Bois, but Frederick Douglass. And Douglass describes a, an intense moment of political wrangling and debate of historical uh, reckoning, 1852. What to the slave is the 4th of July? And he asked the question in large measure to prompt an answer that he already has. He says, at a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ears, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. Not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened, the conscience of the nation must be roused, the propriety of the nation must be startled, the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man proclaimed and denounced." Unquote. Now I hear that and it sounds a little bit unsettling. 
but I actually find a great deal of comfort in it. And I want to just say that it's a, it's a way for us to think about the importance of irony, as was raised in another convening during this conference, the importance of keeping a little bit of fire in the belly as we think about the future of this work. But I also want to caution against us falling into what I learned in 2020 was a kind of affective trap. In my particular past at being a so-called public intellectual, I found myself writing a number of things in response to the Freddie Gay uprising, New York Times, or you write something that goes in the Post, on liberalism in Charlottesville, and you try to find a way to stir the pot with indignation, irony, scorching, and otherwise. Right? But there's a dance that we do where we encourage subaltern folks to actually rage for a moment so that we can snap back into place. And I got to the point in 2020 where I was frankly tired of doing that dance. And so my family and I decided in, in the spirit of what is to be done to start a children's reading program that we put on YouTube, Storytime with Dr. Connolly. You can find it if you like. I wrote a theme song and everything. <laughs> it's my ringtone on my phone. Now, it's not necessarily an answer, but it is to simply say that good old-fashioned provisioning of the kind that was going on during the age of Reconstruction, helping people understand the importance of history as a part of self-making, and community-making, of institution-making, of institutional enforcement, that kind of normalization of the stories that we consider to be important in whatever genre we care about, that can be extraordinarily edifying and refueling, but also potentially transformative. And so it's in that spirit that I encourage us all to try to find the spaces where we can do a little bit of reconstructive work, and if necessary, wage a little of irony as well. So, thank you. Do I have to push any buttons now for this mic to be on? Uh, thank you all for an incredibly stimulating set of presentations. I would like now to open the floor uh, for questions. From it's not that <laughs> 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 uh, Who would like to answer that question? It, it is correct. That's correct? <laughs> yeah. correct? Okay, correct. Yes. <laughs> Jonathan. Hi. Um, so I'd kind of like to ask about the history wars, which many of you obviously brought up or, or focused on. Um, and it speaks um, something to me very specifically. As, as I mentioned yesterday, it's been the last couple of years as a um, history teacher uh, in Tennessee, where I was uh, once reamed out for comparing um, the legacy of the Holocaust in Germany to the legacy of um, the Confederacy in the South. And that was seen by my principal of my school told me that was um, uh, angered many parents and alumni for being uh, too critical of, of the Confederacy and of, of, of slavery, of course, and of my uh, students' great-grandparents. Um, but, I, but I would like to ask seriously, as much as we can talk about Christopher Rufo and DeSantis and Youngkin as being hacks, is there no way in which historians, the current historical profession, should take a look in the mirror when we talk about, when we complain about um, the right wing for degrading American institutions and not respecting them. And then at the same conference here, I hear that the Constitution is a silly, ridiculous, and flimsy document. When we talk about the not respecting elections and talk about the 2000 election, um, when, we, uh, when we discuss um, any aspect of when we talk about academic freedom and hear that this is a, a, a great moral norm, but many of you have also talked about the need, as I think Dr. Connolly was just talking about, for governments to get involved, to take action, to shape, whether as stimulus, not maybe negative, more positive, I think you were kind of suggesting, the, the government, but we also hear that there is, uh, that this is a, a, an unmitigated bad for the government to get involved in trying to control what's in the classroom. Is there any way in which we historians should take a look in the mirror and say, there are some contradictions here? Eric, you want to take that? What is it they say about historians? Is two historians three opinions? I mean, you expected us to agree here? <laughs> 
I mean, I, I, you listed a number of things that various people said, but did any one person say the, all of those things? Or the, the institution's point, I, I uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to, I, 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 but yeah. it's okay. Sorry, Gary, I don't want to. But if um, I've heard many people, I think yesterday, talk about um, concern over the degrading of institutions by the right wing and the disrespect for elections. And I also heard the same people talk about American institutions, civil society as being barely functioning, in co chaotic and ill-defined. I heard discussion of elections, the degrading of elections on January 6th, 2021, but the rejection of previous elections. And if there are contradictions there, what I used to hear from my students and, my, uh, and the parents of those students, many of whom I disagree with passionately in, in Tennessee, was a feeling that this was equal. And I like to think if, I would like to know if you have any thoughts on that. That those were, that those were equivalent things. I'm not saying they are. Those were, those, were the, those were the concerns that I heard voiced again and again, was that what the right wing did with the degrading of American institutions 2021 was just equivalent. The discussion between academic freedom of is it, is, it, is it just tit for tat? In, in which case, sorry, I don't want to go on, but. I, I, I you know, I, I think that it sounds to me like you're ventriloquizing uh, complaints that you've heard and asking don't they apply here. I mean, this is where history must uh, come in. Let us take, for example, the difference that between, if I could, Nathan, the, between January 6th, 2001 and that in 2021. I think it seems like a substantial difference that a good historian would point out, or teacher of history, that the electoral count in 2001 was not going to reflect the voters' will in the state of Florida, right? The law then prevailing in the state of Florida was that a voter's intention, could it be determined, should be counted. That didn't happen. So if you are in favor of the voters determining the winner of the election in the state of Florida, under the law then prevailing in the state of Florida, you might be dismayed that the Supreme Court shot that down. And you might feel that democratic uh, you know, ideals were being disregarded. If you like democratic ideals, you would then in 2021 have to say that the protesters were not on your side. To degrade an election is not a single thing, a generic activity. Right? Historians deal in specifics. We deal in empirical data. We have to explain that what happened here is not what happened there. As I don't need to tell you, because you know the difference between the Holocaust and the Confederacy, and you also know what the similarities are, too. Right? I think this is one of those points where, um, just to, to build further, it really does benefit us to have good old-fashioned conversations about interests and what interests are served by particular uses of institutions or suggesting that things need to be kicked into the realm of the so-called private sector and the market, right? These are not um, abstract principles. They are absolutely, building on the point about specifics, about advancing particular kinds of stories. John C. Calhoun likes a strong federal government when it can capture runaway slaves. He wants a weak federal government as it concerns secession, right? The question of the Confederacy is about how am I reflected as a white Tennessean of several generations in the school curriculum? How am I being characterized? And the debate around whether or not certain names are going to stay on university buildings, oftentimes it's direct descendants of those people who are raising the biggest concerns. It's in fact Du Bois who points out in Black Reconstruction that many of the revisionists in Reconstruction's history are themselves the nephews and grandsons of Confederate officers. They write the first draft of the history, right? And so this is where, you know, we don't have to worry about, again, being kind of impolitic, but I think it's important to have a discussion about the fact that there's a discussion. And that in many cases, what the, you don't want to have in these places where they're concerned about historical analogy is actual debate as to whether or not the Confederacy is even a country, as came up yesterday, right? or whether or not it's part of a just really well-resourced terrorist organization, right? Some people, I'm not saying this is my argument, could make the claim that the Republican Party, in light of its attempt to overthrow the government to some degree in 2021, engaged in a kind of terrorist activity. There were people who had their lives threatened directly, and yet the party itself, last I checked, was not under any formal investigation. Why is that the case? Or I should say, not the case. Right? Whose interest does it serve to not have that party 
brought to bear as a set of historical interrogations. So, you know, I don't know whether or not the, the contradiction question is entirely fruitful if you're only dealing at the realm of state or no state, capital or no capital, and so on. But I do think it's an invitation to ask the question as to why certain standards about the acceptability of state action, of secession, separatism, gun ownership, market, <coughs> and so forth, are acceptable for one population and not another. That, to me, feels like a fruitful way to think about it. Honor, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely clear on the question that's being asked. I think that's 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 why I'm hesitating. So, but I, I, if you want to, if we want to talk later, I'm happy to if you could clarify. So I'm going to let that go, and with the understanding that maybe we'll come back to it yeah. later. Nick. Yeah. Hi, Gary. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to make sure that folks who are on the live stream uh, know that we are monitoring Q&A. If you have a question, just put it in the Q&A, and we can see it. So I've got one here, which I'm going to throw you just to make the live stream folks feel loved too. Um, here is the question. Um, I actually think maybe it's Gary who's written this. In a polarizing environment, how can we encourage young people to listen more, to think critically, and to remain hopeful? That sounds like a Gerstle plant. <laughs> uh, who on the panel would like to take that on? I saw Gary tapping on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got accomplices out there. Yeah. So, well, uh, Honor, you yeah. you were talking about hope. So why don't we start with you? <laughs> um, this is something that I think about a lot <laughs> because. A, Bring the so, mic oh. closer to you. In, in some ways, something happened. I don't know exactly when, but I became the age of my students' parents. And <laughs> suddenly I realized that I had apps, you know, there's this moment where, you, where you, you realize that you fundamentally do not understand how your students think anymore. Um, what's kinds of, you know, issues, things, um, you know, modes of receiving information, modes of processing information. Um, and, and so in many ways it has forced me constantly to have to rethink how I deliver information to them. Um, many of the ways that I was trained to do these things, to think critically, to listen, to understand, to learn, no longer, you know, uh, are absorbed by brains that were raised in a fundamentally different um, learning landscape. So in many ways, one of the things that I've adopted as a strategy to deal with this sort of widening gap is is to allow, you know give them a little bit of what I'm accustomed to. You know, train them in the sort of you know traditional ways of reading, analyzing documents, exploring primary sources. Um, you know, crafting essays. But at the end of every semester, I've started doing assignments that are, uh, in which I allow my students to sort of spit the information that I have given them back to me in ways that are legible to them. And this has really helped me um, to, to see, you know, students engagement in a whole new way. It, it allows me to see what they understand is important. Um, they, I mean, it's, it's wide open. I've, I have gotten, you know, video games. I have gotten a lot of podcasts. This is a big podcast generation. They prefer to understand through talking. They like conversation. Um, I've gotten documentary films. I've gotten, um, you know, Poetry, music, all these sorts of things, uh, you know, they, 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 it, it, it provides a, a, a way for them to sort of process information that, that, that's legible to them. I mean, that's essentially what history is, is an act of translation. We take primary sources, we analyze documents, and then we translate it into ways that we're familiar, you know, a language that we understand. Our language, you know, for us up here, you know, was narrative for the most part. 
their language is a little different, you know, and I think other you know, historians are starting to get, you know, um, get in on this program. They're, you know, I, I taught a course on, on history through graphic novels that was hands down the most successful course I've ever taught. The level of analysis, the ways in which students were able to see how historians take documents and animate them, literally, bring them to life. You know, I've, I've, I've taught a, a, a document that's um, a 17th century uh, Dutch fur trader, um, his journal of, of uh, exploring up, upstate New York. It's an incredibly boring written document, but I saw, it's really, it's dry as, as anything. Um, and I signed it as a graph, graphic novel and it absolutely comes to life. And this is, in many ways, you know, I'm not saying this is something that, you know, in many ways, you know, some of my colleagues are like, isn't this sort of like cartoon history? But it's actually just a much more complex way of, of layering levels of, uh, of analysis, presentation, and understanding. So I, I found, in many ways, that a way to encourage students to think critically is to allow them to tell me how they think critically, as opposed to, you know, exclusively giving them expectations that are of my own design. Corrine, you were about to jump in before I yeah, asked so Honor I, to speak, so. Um, I teach this class um, called Film and U.S. History, which is largely about ruining all Hollywood films for my students. <laughs> and um, we talk about this idea of like the Hollywood ending, right? Mm -hmm. And part of the class is about explaining the ways in which these Hollywood films depict the past versus um, how historians have interpreted the past in different ways. And I think that my students in all of my classes know that there is no Hollywood ending in history, you know, in a lot of people's histories. Um, so I guess I, I don't see it as my job to instill hope in my students, right? I don't think that's part of my job. <laughs> my job is to teach my students about the past. <laughs> and that's what's important, and that can be very empowering, right? Um, but that includes knowing the good and the bad parts of history. So for me, yeah, it's not my job. And I understand the question. I get where they're coming from. But it's not my job to, to instill hope. My, my job is to teach about the past. Can I? Yeah, Nathan. Um, so I'm going to move in a little closer in a second. But um, there are a lot of different um, wellsprings for what is now um, ca called and often mischaracterized critical race theory. You think about the Combahee River Collective, and I think about the work of Derrick Bell. And those who are familiar with the work of the attorney and legal theorist Derrick Bell know that one of the things that he talks about is the permanence of racism. He writes about this from the vantage point of the Reagan era, having fought a whole host of battles to try to get desegregation to be real across the South, and he's seeing the retrenchment of these forces to basically unmake <coughs> the law of the Civil Rights Act. Now, Bell's point is that we are not simply to talk about the day in which racism will end, that we actually need to accept the permanence of racism in society and struggle nonetheless, and struggle nonetheless. And this is actually a really important way of understanding all of the incredible context that goes into basically you know, the 19th and the 20th century as people are enslaved and Jim Crowed and marginalized and they're still producing incredible art, building communities, raising families. And it's not always about chasing a crystal stair, right? For many people, it's about, again, doing things that are hyper local and intimate and important to them personally and in communi community terms. And I, I, I want to echo the point that you can't actually give somebody hope. That's not yours to give, right? Hope comes from, I mean, folks, folks who may raise children, right? You have a child who ties their shoe for the first time, come on. You see the look on their face, right? The first time a butterfly lands on their finger, you didn't give them that, right? But there's a certain kind of conceit that we are supposed to be handing these things out, like participation ribbons. Instead of teaching people how to, I think as the panelists said, deal with the fact that certain things are not meant to be changed by the arm of the one lone individual acting on the world, but that we're part of generational struggles and struggles and struggles, and to be okay with that to accept that as actually the human condition. You floss your teeth today, you floss them tomorrow, and the next day after that, hopefully. There's not a day where you wake up and you don't brush your damn teeth. 
but we have this feeling that somehow there's going to be a day in which we don't have to struggle in these other arenas. And I think that that's a Hollywood way of thinking about it. Yes, Will. Thanks. Wait for, the, wait for the microphone to reach you. Thanks for these really great presentations. It was really very powerful. Um, I, I guess I want to try to restate one of the questions about contradictions. And that I, 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 sorry if I mischaracterize it, but this is what I found interesting in it. And it's the tension I think that we saw between the the place that Eric's presentation started of asserting um, our sort of need for autonomy and intellectual and academic freedom. Um, the tension between that position and where Nathan ended, asserting our dependence upon bigger institutions, whether they're for funding or for um, advancing a vision of the academy um, through federal anti-discrimination policies. And I wonder how, how, how do we sort of square that that space, right, Be, or that that you know between that distance between those two positions, which I think many of us hold hold both of them very dear, um, and and really shape our our ability to act as intellectuals, both the the need for autonomy and independence, and the ability to base our teaching and our scholarship on the you know on the intellectual tools that we've developed as scholars, and yet we also are very deeply dependent upon the state and on, on our, our political institutions for that, that autonomy and that freedom and our ability to act as intellectuals. So I just wondered if you, if you wanted to dwell on that. So I'll start um, just briefly. So, so Johns Hopkins University is still the largest recipient of federal funds of any major university, in spite of the fact that we don't have a really robust federal anti-discrimination measure, right? So this is an accounting problem, in part. Like, where is the federal support actually going? Where is the, the state's regulatory power being most emphatically applied? Right? I don't, I don't, in the same way that it's not about ever removing the fact of, you know, um, yeah, money from the, from the discussion, the government is always going to play a role in setting the terms. And so I think part of, I think Eric and I actually agree, because so much of what's important is setting the parameters for people to engage in free thinking and autonomy. I can't tell you the concern that so many of my colleagues have when you desegregate these institutions and there's no protections there to ensure that your encounter with discrimination, racism, sexism isn't going to be shuffled into some office, but you know, general counsel, and then you never hear from folks again, right? So, so, so autonomy comes in the defense of it and you need government protection of some kind to stand outside of the apparatus of the university as a hierarchy, which again, it's incredible to me. Talk about setting the terms of the debate. We talk about universities like they're these radical institutions. <laughs> That's the punchline, right? right? Right, I mean, come on. Anybody who spent a little bit of time in these places knows how they're run and who's running them. But that's the way that the conversation, the public turns, like, oh, this, these are hotbeds of, <laughs> I'm sorry, you get the idea. <laughs> so, so, so again, I think this is where it's important to say, you know, to have autonomy in place, maybe some of the forces that are already pressing against us need to be told to back up a little bit with the help of some state protection. That's all. Yeah. Eric, did you want to come in on that? I'm a horrible procedural liberal, and I should probably be first against the wall when the revolution comes. I, what, do you, what do you want me to say? Well, I mean, the, look, the... Uh, I, to be less glib for a second, the, uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it's fundamental, again, I'm not a lawyer, but it's fundamental to the basic law of free speech that the government may set the time, place, and manner, but not the content, right? And that's sort of the same kind of, you can extrapolate from that to the nature of the university, whether public or private, that's receiving federal funds or has been provided with federal money to you know, serve the people of a given state, that they can say, that set the time, place, and manner. They can say, you, know, you, you, you must take an oath that you won't support uh, treasonous uh, insurrections and things like that. And in return for which, we give you uh, the money. And then you go and you teach what you're supposed to teach because you are a competent community of inquiry. Right. So there, there, there is always going to be a kind of public stake, a kind of state stake 
uh, in, the, in the foundations of these institutions, but they're not supposed to interfere in the content of the operation. That's supposed to be served by, again, a competent but independent community. Yes. Um, I wanted to make a point about, um, if we think about the, oh, it's not about the George Floyd moment, but there becomes moments where someone was talking on the panel about the despair of the 90s and no one's listening. Mm. And there come other moments where, because of the imperative of a situation, people's hunger for history rises exponentially within an incredibly short space of time. So we see a spike where history and politics and the moment all seem to rise upwards almost in a vortex. And I wanted to make a point about something I saw in the late 80s in the United Kingdom, where the two series of the PBS series, Eyes on a Prize, played. Mm. And the first series deals with, um, from the Supreme Court, for about the education verdict through to the Freedom Rides um, and the, the March on Selma. And that, for many people, uh, it was on the, played on BBC Two and it dropped very well and people watched it. The second season took up on the rise of black nationalism, the elections in places like Cleveland and the mayors, and it went through uh, the black power movement, the, uh, the situation um, of um, punishment in places like Attica and the riots. Um, and what I noticed within my friendships and in the wider conversations was the second series traveled in a way that the first series didn't within conversation. The way that series was presented, the fact that the footage had never been seen before and accumulated like that, even though today we, it might be accumulated differently, but at that time. And so it seems to me, and it's a question I'd like to you, and, it, and you raised just a moment about how, for example, with the, um, the anime or with the uh, comic book presentation, it seems to me part of history's conversation is at times what the backlash is scared of is the rapid transmission of a history that people are hungry for. And so they're trying to kill two things at source with the chilling. They're trying to stop people saying things, but really what they can't address is the demand. So they're trying to address the supply. Mm -hmm. They're using a supply, pro supply side mm -hmm. set of agenda. But it seems to me that the demand will never go down. And it seems to me, especially within the younger generation, <coughs> demand will rise and become more specific. So while on the one hand, the supply side means it's difficult to supply it in existing ways, as is always, I think, when people realize the demand and attune their historical knowledge to that, then these ultimately, in the short term, these chilling effects will happen. But it strikes me that in the long term, the, the demand for that amongst the people who have access to all kinds of technological innovations will win out because historians, especially those that are talented, will find a way to say what they have to say. Does anyone want to respond to that or should we, should we let that stand as a comment? I have actually have a question that comes out of that. If, can I use the chair's prerogative? I will, okay. Uh, this is not the first time there's been uh, an effort to sh shut down the teaching of certain subjects at American schools and universities. The United States has a long and robust history of that. The two Red Scares, one after World War I, another after World War II, to shut down teaching of socialist subjects, which became incredibly capacious in ter terms of definition of uh, socialism, including novels by all kinds of writers who had nothing to do with uh, socialism. In the 1920s, there was an effort to, in several states, actually to abolish Catholic schools uh, and delegitimate the because it was considered inimical to uh, Republican citizenship. And Nathan, you mentioned, of course, the original Reconstruction, right? The effort to uh, rebuild America on a racially egalitarian foundation, which was which from the start, which was part of your point, as I gather, uh, an intellectual project as well as a political and social project. So, as historians when you reflect on these earlier moments of um, repression, what lessons can we draw from them that would be useful in terms of the current battles? And here, I, I'm, this is really in response to your 
comment, which is that people find a way to reclaim the history that's been denied them. And I think, Nathan, that was part of your point as well. But I just wanted to generalize that question and to ask um, each, each of the panelists who would like to make a contribution to this to, dis to put this in historical context. What does history teach us about the struggle against these kinds of moments? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start and say um, some of my advisors at Columbia, notably one of them, um, had family members that were blacklisted, of course, during the McCarthy era. Um, and when I started working on what I was working on, which is you know the history of American Islamophobia in the post 9-11 world, they were the ones that actually helped me think about that moment in ways that were very similar to McCarthyism, right? Um, and that the tactics and the strategies are not, were not entirely different and that the people being targeted it was a new population, but again, that the strategies were very similar. And so for me, that was very instructive, right, in thinking about how I framed my research. Um, and in many ways, it's kind of sad, right, because I'm writing about Islamophobia, and I'm kind of using, the, the <laughs> using these examples from the past. But I think the idea is if you are exposing it, if you're talking about it, if you're comparing it to these past examples, maybe that, I don't mean to be naive, but like to think that we can still learn from this past, like a usable past, right? Um, I also realized I was addressing you in the previous question when you were not in fact the person who asked that question. So um, yeah, so I'll just. <coughs> Anyone else? I think you're right that the demand is going to find its supply one way or another, right? And then in a way, that's very encouraging. I mean, after all, what's at stake here is not history, right? History is going to be there. The empirical data are going to be there whether or not we get to exhume it. What we are fighting for, if I can put on my conservative institutionalist hat again, is the right to do it in comfortable university environments where we get paid a living wage or even possibly better. And uh, if I can be less cynical, though, about that agenda, though, I think we're also fighting to have it be part of an acknowledged place at the center of, for lack of a better word, our culture. Right, that we want it to be something that is enshrined and given dignity in places like this one, this room, where it can have respect because we think that there is a civilizational value in acknowledging the truth, even if it's unpleasant and uncomfortable. So yes, people will get it, people will find it, people will read Samizdat if they have to, right? But we would, we think it's preferable, if I may use that, uh, the, the first person plural, we think it's preferable that it have a place in institutions that are acknowledged as respectable and dignified like this one. I mean, if I can just add to that, I mean, it's sort of, this is kind of in a different direction. I mean, I, the question of, you know, supply and demand and, and, you know, what we are allowed to speak about in our classrooms, I, the, these are very real political um, uh, concerns, you know, and legislation is is being written constantly, you know, all over the country to sort of you know control what can and can't be said in classrooms. In some ways, however, m my greater fear is not that is not what we can and <coughs> can't say in the classroom, but rather the larger campaign <coughs> that's not just political, but really institutional to sort of delegitimize the humanities generally. Mm. You know, I don't think it's so much a concern that, you know, whether or not I can talk about X, Y, or Z in the classroom if I don't have students to teach. You know, there's been, <coughs> excuse me, in the past, I don't know, 20 years, um, you know, this, this real concerted effort to sort of shift resources within universities away from the humanities and towards you know, engineering programs, professional programs, vocational programs. Most of my career before I was at, <coughs> excuse me, at um, Colorado, I taught in Western North Carolina. And, you know, every single day I was waking up wondering whether or not the history program was going to exist the next week. You know, it was always sort of on the chopping block as, 
you know, the, the administration decided to build a new school of nursing or something. You know, this sort of trade schoolification of universities. That, to me, is far more threatening than a, a sort of paper. I, I, I don't want to minimize the paper tigers of, of legislation because they're real, right? This is, you know, this is part of the discourse that then influences these decisions within the universities. But, you know, I think that that, that question of what is happening to the humanities generally within these institutions is, 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 is a larger sort of umbrella over your question. Can I just add to that? Um, <clears throat> I also think this is not just a US problem, right? I mean, I was just at a conference in the United States with many historians who live in the UK, right? And they, several of them were waiting for the emails to be told that they were going to lose their jobs, right? So there was a, a, you know, quite a bit of anxiety um, because entire history departments are being eliminated. Uh, so yeah, again, I think this is not something that's limited to the United States this is something that is, you know, happening here as well. As you've been waiting patiently, wait for the microphone. Hi, sorry, I'm anxious to ask a question because I have a meeting at six <laughs> that I have to dash to. Um, I have a bit of a two-parter question, if that's okay. Um, I'm, for context, um, I'm writing my dissertation currently, um, and I'll share the title with you because I hope that it will spark the amusement that it sparks in me. Um, I titled it, I Pledge Allegiance to the Past, Patriotism, Citizenship, Education, and Symbolism in Virginian Public Education. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from the state of Virginia, um, and I came today uh, to kind of gain some more insight uh, into sort of like fellow academics working on the other side, mostly because I got called a colonialist by my cousin for studying my home state from <laughs> UK, which I thought was ironic. Um, my question, though, uh, to you is, uh, the first part is, because uh, talking about the sort of history or the culture wars or whatever you want to call it, um, someone brought up like the school board hearings and stuff like this. Um, in Virginia in particular, there was just recently uh, a new release of standards of learning for uh, education. Um, and part of my dissertation is looking at the public commentary on the school boards. So my first question um, regarding this sort of idea of culture wars in the larger community is um, what do you see as, or do you even see uh, a larger role of community and policy standards of education, specifically in something like the history and social sciences, which in a sense is almost sort of shaped by uh, either the state or the local context that it's in? That's the first, first question. I think we may just stick with one question if we can, because we got others in the queue. So, who who would like to take who would like to take that? Um, I think it's undeniable that being aware of um, the different jurisdictions that determine the content of our education is really important. I think one of the things that comes up um, repeatedly in conversations about educational history um, is the role of the, the state government and, and the importance of state level politics, as, I'm, as I know you appreciate. Um, I, I would have said in a different moment that people aren't aware of, of the need to apply pressure at the state level as much as maybe they ought be. I think that that's changed a lot, especially in the last um, four or five years. A lot of people are talking about um, state level response. I'm thinking about William Barber in North Carolina. People like um, Stacey Abrams and a whole host of activists in places like California. I mean, there's been a lot of work at state level to think through some of these problems. But again, this is a question about capacity, a question about organization, a question about shared documents and tactics. You know, a lot of the folks who work in the American Legislative Exchange Council that put you know more right wing policies in, in at the state level, they have template documents that they just simply circulate and let people kind of fill in the blank, right? And so, um, you know, there there are absolutely needs of working at the school board level, at the state, you know, education board level. But, you know, again, I mean, a lot of this falls back into just the basic question of what's people's ability to keep pressure on with these movements. And, you know, basic things like living wages go a long way to determining whether or not people can be politically engaged as well. And so there's a certain kind of entanglement to these questions. Nick, you have a question from the world of Zoom. Yeah, well, I, I worry that one of these, I'm going to paraphrase him because I know we only have another 10 or 15 minutes for questions, but um, I think one may end up actually being for Gary, which is whether the U.S. history wars are completely exceptional and distinctive or whether you think they might have implications for us here in the U.K. So that's one question for you. The other one, 
um, for everyone. Riffing off the question that James asked, I'm afraid James just left, but um, James asked about the idea that there was a kind of a fusion of history uh, around 1619, this thirst for history, you know, that passion will always be satisfied. The question is, can the other panelists tell us what's special and what matters about having an unfettered university environment for teaching and researching history. So as opposed to this kind of like gonzo, history will out, it will come out of the rocks, we'll always get history. What is it about the university experience in terms of teaching and research that we ought to be defending beyond all that kind of popular history that perhaps takes place outside the academy? So I don't know if you want to have a go at the first one first, Gary, about US, UK history wars. Is there any connection? Yes. Um. <laughs> Uh, next question. The, um, uh, well, I feel, Nick, you should be the one to address this question because you've thought about it most. Uh, I'm just chairing the panel. Thought about it most systematically. Um, I think the, the issues um, that we've been talking about in the U.S. are present and urgent in the U.K. Uh, we are fighting about these issues at this university. Multiple other universities are... Um, uh, fighting along these lines. I think the particular shape uh, of how the issue is framed is, 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 is somewhat different in some respects. There are um, some similarities, but also differences. Uh, multiple institutions are, are trying to recover uh, um, the, their involvement in the slave trade, uh, the profits from slavery, uh, a big study done um, to document um, uh, all of those um, slaveholders who were compensated for uh, the emancipation of, of the slaves in the 1830s in the UK and documenting where that money went and how it has accumulated over the last hundred and, um, well, more than 150 years, and nearly 200 years now, we're coming up to the 200th uh, anniversary of that. Uh, it's interesting in that regard to draw a contrast between the UK and, and the US and, and, and that the slaveholders in the US were not compensated directly for um, emancipation in the ways in which slaveholders in, in, in Britain were. Uh, it's an interesting comparison to develop. So I think the, the issue is, uh, is very live here and I think the um, uh, the resistance and the, uh, the counterattack is also present, uh, perhaps not as fierce um, in the UK as it is in the US, but significant uh, and powerful. Uh, and also, I think the way in which uh, an important difference emerges is uh, the status of empire uh, and uh, colonial subjecthood has for obvious reasons uh, a salience in the UK that it does not have in the US. The US, of course, uh, through uh, the theory of settler colonialism, now treats continental expansion uh, as a form of imperial expansion. Uh, but it, uh, the empire does not, still does not loom as large uh, in the American imagination as it does in the UK. Uh, what we come back to again and again uh, in the U.S. Uh, is slavery, civil war, emancipation, reconstruction. That forms the heart of the argument in the U.S. and the parallel heart of the argument um, in the U.K. Uh, is more over empire. There are obviously points of connection and intersection, but it lends a somewhat different emphasis to the struggles uh, in both uh, countries. So I would say the, uh, the struggles go on here, uh, but the intensity is not quite as great as in the United States. Uh, and also the system of government is, is different. Uh, so much of this is happening through the states in the United States, and there's no direct parallel for the state action and state opportunity in the UK. Just to piggyback on that, I mean, to the extent that uh, the Opponents of 
many of the prevailing trends in the academy in both countries are uh, using the same word, woke, uh, which of course is uh, appropriated from African American vernacular English, like so much that becomes current, uh, that, that now that same term is now being used by people who sneer at uh, the teaching of African American history, and particularly the history of the slave trade that unites the history of both these countries seems to me to be a very evident uh, you know, links between those two phenomena. Um, in terms of the second question, which I took to be defend the, uh, <laughs> the training of professional historians in the academy, I mean, I, at one level, the glib answer is defend the training of professional physicists in the academy. Surely we can, you know, drop balls into sand pits in our own garages and things like that, and therefore we can derive, uh, you know, uh, at, and, and there's nothing wrong with the glib answer. I mean, but th there, there is um, therefore understood to be some value in the essentially medieval apprenticeship uh, you know, structures of academic training, that you go to people who are experts in the field, who are experts in the methods of the field, and you ask them, how do I do this? And you cluster around them in groups of three and five, and then they explain it to you over a period of some years, and then they supervise you as you gradually learn to do it yourself. This is, a, you know, as it says, this is a, uh, broadly speaking, an outline of university education at the professional level that obtains in all fields. Now, it's true that a physicist requires much greater uh, funding, uh, well, than I do. Maybe you guys get physicist level funding. But, um, uh, but, but still, you know, the idea that there should be institutional support for archival trips, which otherwise leaves the pursuit of uh, uh, history to, you know, gentlemen of leisure and of independent means, uh, right, I think that, that, that the public interest in, in, in funding that, that, that kind of research, the public interest in valuing, you know, the truth as established through empirical methods and other specialist forms of analysis uh, is something that, that, that we want to defend, I think. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question and also go back to your question. Um, about the role of community. So I, I was born in um, small town Iowa and my parents were both French. And um, when I went to kindergarten, about a week later I came back home and I asked my mom, um, who's Jesus? And she said, where did you hear <laughs> that from? And my, my kindergarten teacher told me about Jesus and that you know, he was really important and that I needed to believe in him. And my mother called my kindergarten teacher and reamed her out. like. I, I do not, you know, want to have been on the receiving end of my strongly, you know, accented French mother reminding my kindergarten teacher about the separation of church and state. Now, I'm saying this because, you know, as, as the daughter of French immigrants, um, one of the only kids who had any kind of color on her face, right, I face these questions again and again, and I go back to that Langston Hughes poem, I too am America, right? So that's why I think it's important that we include these voices, right? That we're here and that we talk about different forms of different people's history in the United States. And I think part of the community role is people like, you know, my mother, may she rest in peace, calling out and reaming out my kindergarten teacher. Sure. Uh, Nick, how much more time do we have? One more, if there is one. Um, there, I think we have two more, Josie and then Richard. And I don't know about you, Sam. I don't know if I can do that. Uh, but uh, how many minutes do we have? Uh, well, I did, yeah. We were supposed to be out there before six, so we have about 10 minutes. Stop. I think Nathan wanted to, to answer that. Can, can I answer the, the, the question about universities and their value briefly? Or should I? I, I can, well, I can let me ask you to hold it, and okay. I'm going to get three people to ask That's questions. I have things to say about you. Uh, and, <laughs> Um, and then uh, to have the three questions come out all now, okay. uh, and then each of you um, can have the last word. So uh, Richard, Josie, and Sam. It doesn't matter which order. Um, I had a question for Kareen and perhaps also for Gary, but maybe not if there's not much time. Um, and I wanted to ask what your experiences of teaching and studying American history outside of the US what advantages that may confer in sort of being a little more distant from these history wars, but also what problems that gives and how, as someone studying United States history, um, you can sort of make a contribution to those history wars and, and to society 
um, despite being distant from them. Uh, Josie, you put your hand up so you can, the mic will come to you. Thank you. Um, mine is more of a pragmatic question for the graduate students. Maybe I'm the only one that has a question, but um, I'm wondering that if, like, what do we do if there are no jobs, but we still want to be invested in history? And then Richard. Thanks. I just wanted to continue this discussion about funding briefly. So um, Dr. Connolly asked the question, do we let the philanthropists set the agenda? And many of us in the room would say no emphatically and look to the state as the source of that. And we had a fruitful discussion about the risks of that as well, that state funding can be used for both positive ends, like the example from Hugh, and in that same decade, for negative ends, the Defense Department funding Vietnam Study Project at <laughs> Michigan State and so on. So we've come to a point where we believe that state sets the terms of autonomy, but of course, state funding depends on continued public consent for that enterprise. And my question is about what happens when that public support diminishes and how that in itself becomes a chilling effect on the content where public reaction to the academy becomes hostile, a sense that the public and the academy don't recognize each other. And I think this is particularly true when academics take a, a critical approach to society. And so what do you think as academics can be done about that dilemma? So let me suggest we start with you, Nathan. All right. Kareen, Honor, mm -hmm. Eric. Um, and so this is your opportunity to both answer the questions that remain and to make any <laughs> general statement that you wish to leave the audience Oh, goodness with. gracious. OK, here we go. Not just for you, for everybody. OK, so I'll start with the last point first. Um, so I, I, I like this point about the, the public and, it, and its will, um, but I also want to just continue to emphasize that the who, who constitutes the public is not a demographic question, it's a political question, right? There, there are all kind of ways in which minorities <laughs> of one kind or another exercise outsized authority in a particular context if they have political power. And so again, I think it's, it's just absolutely, yet again, uh, a way of encouraging us to think about the ways in which we organize and we press the question of what is intellectually essential, important, and valuable, um, and not shy from that in the same way that, again, the founders of the modern research university did not shy away from that question. I think Adams, for all of his flaws, and they were many, was right about the value of the university and what it can do. I mean, they, they did what they set out to do. They reshaped North American institutions in their likeness. They won that agenda. Right? They, they did what they said they were going to do. And I, so I, I look at that and I say, all right, that's a great model. Thank you. Let's think about what universities can do. So when I think about the university as a place to help change engagements and propel engagement with the public, I think, for instance, about the wonderful calendar that comes with being in the academy and the kinds of time you get for rest, deep study, supporting family. That is an important element of what we are able to do in a sustained way frankly, is the vacation time. It's the way in which you build certain long-form projects. You can actually work with institutions in a way that provides you with some flexibility. Having a flexible schedule is a really important part of the power of the university and the work that it can perform. Similarly, as we know, foundations are able to see your work easier when you're in these kind of university settings, right? So the availability of other kinds of support. Now, again, we can talk all about foundations. Again, the Slater Fund example was one that I gave from the outset as part of a cautionary tale, right? But I've also talked with foundation heads who are like, we have no idea who these really innovative people are at the local level because they're not part of these channels of information and networks, right? So there's a networking imperative that the university allows us to then use to plug in with other resources, bring together like-minded people. There's physical space for gathering and convening, right? These are, in some ways, important institutions of civil society for that reason as well. I think about the workers inside of universities. So there's a place where staff and students and faculty could actually meet and think about how to set an intellectual agenda. Some of my most important collaborations intellectually have been with staff inside of my institutions that I belong to, whether NYU or Johns Hopkins, right? They actually know how the institutional plumbing works. They find funding streams. They know how to think about institutional memory and ways of advancing 
questions that are really important, as well as the fact that for many people, the kind of gainful employment that comes with working at a library desk or a, a, as a department secretary in a university is an incredible pathway into getting a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or something else. Like We cannot, in all of our concerns about you know, the faculty or graduate students, ignore the fact that we have intellectuals around us at every particular juncture, and the staff are part of that. And I, and I consider it to be one of the most important elements of what we do in universities to have other kinds of workers so nearby as potential collaborators. So we can encourage that. I think it's important as well. The last point I want to make. Uh, brief, briefly, because we're running out of time. Thank you, Gary. Um, <laughs> it's about uh, the, the, the job market question, because um, it's come up a couple times. And, and look, like, I, I don't know how you generate and create more jobs. I'm not a job creator, right? Um, but I do know that doctoral education, I think, would do very well to lean back into the question of skills and skill building. What can you actually do year one, year two, year three? I think, again, the old Teutonic model was not concerned about creating professors, but advancing people with certain kinds of skills to make institutions move and do things. I think we can do the same, and if you're, go if you're currently in a grad program, you know, I'm not saying you know, think simply vocationally, but that the skill set in pursuing doctoral education has a lot of different uses beyond the academy, and people are aware of that and they talk about it, but advancing your skill set in ways that are broadly applicable is not a bad way to think about the work. So that's it. Um, I'll try to be quick. But let me, let me push back on what <coughs> one thing that Nathan said, and this I think is, is very different according to who you are. Um, this, this idea that universities are really supportive of families. Um, mm. It depends on who you are because there's a reason that, you know, only one third of tenured women have children in academia. Um, I'll leave that there. Uh, to your question about um, what it's like to teach outside the United States, I think one of the best things is that I show my students how to kind of tear apart some of the myths around the United States. And I also, we talk about the fact that the United States is not the only one with these myths, right? And we talk about the ways in which history is political and history can be very constructed. And I will have like an Indian student in my class alongside a Pakistani student, and we laugh about the ways in which they learn about each other in their history courses, right? So I think. It's like modeling that, and I'm not modeling that as an American who, you know, I'm modeling that as a historian for them. So the ability to kind of pull apart um, these narratives and these mythologies around our past. Um, and then to your last question, um, to your question, I would say, talk to Krista about public history because I think that's one of the best ways and she's really um, strong in being able to do that in ways that you you know, outside um, academia, the ways in which historians have been able to um, express their passion for history. Um, yeah, I'll take that, the job question, and, and I have lots to say about this, so if I don't finish, feel free to send me an email or whatever, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, we have five minutes, so we gotta finish everything. Okay. Two more, two, I won't speak, but two more comments okay. in five minutes. Um, so when I was in graduate school, they used to talk about plan A and plan B. Right, and plan A was getting a tenure track job. Plan B was like figure, like figure something out, like you know, do go to an OAH panel about it, you know, and all, mm. alternatives. And you know, the way that the structures of the university systems have have evolved over, you know, since I was in graduate school, it, it's it's becoming increasingly apparent to me that plan A isn't really always that great a plan. Like the vast, no, I'm serious. The vast majority of jobs that you could get on the tenure track kind of suck. I've had a lot of them. <laughs> like, I've had a lot of them with, a, you know, in places you don't want to live with low pay and high teaching load, but you're never going to get to write your book. So, you know, and, and you're be, you know, you're, you're going to be devoted to, to administrative tasks for the rest of your life. And it's not great. You know, I've had a lot of people who I went to graduate school who got those jobs who have left academia because they've completely fried. So I no longer think that plan A is the, is the holy grail of, of, um, of jobs, right? In many ways, a lot of people I know that went to what we used to call plan, a, plan B, now I just say a plan, right? 
archive work, um, you know, uh, uh, inst- humanity center work. You know, they, they're, they're thriving. They're going to all the academic conferences. They're allowed to do their own work. They're engaged. They're doing wonderful, you know, Im- important things. So I think we really need to get off of this idea that tenure track jobs are the only jobs and anything else is just sort of like, so poor you, you know, pity, pity jobs. Um, I think that the, the university landscape has changed completely. So, so that's one piece of advice. I'll be quick. The other piece of advice is I, it, don't stress out obsessively about getting internships and finding alternatives and finding, you know, multiple pathways while you're trying to write a dissertation. I have had so many students who just take forever, take out way too many loans, more than they should, you know, just are, are, are completely obsessed with finding alternate careers to the point where they don't actually get to do the work that they're in grad school to do. <coughs> Focus when you're in grad school on finishing that diss, and, and when you get to the end of it, you will be able to reassess, you know, what direction that's going to take you in. So those are my two pieces of practical Thank advice. You. Eric? I'm just going to go with, with your question about uh, studying uh, U.S. history from outside the United States. Uh, sometimes I think that U.S. history should only be studies outside the United States. It's, um, you know, I, I'm only, I, I really mean that, right? I mean, and, and for, again, what I think are obvious reasons that I will nevertheless state, right? Only by getting out of that constant screaming, rowing, polarized atmosphere, right, and getting distance from it, literally, by being here, let's say, can you get sometimes the perspective that you need? If you could somehow <laughs> combine that distance and perspective with the ability readily to access archives that are only located in the heart of the country, that would be great. That's not really possible. But also, it helps you think about the question of audience. Right? Americans, because so much American history is produced in America, are so used to talking about things, there is so often such a shorthand of assumed common knowledge that you immediately realize you don't have when you are talking to someone who has just come up to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever university you happen to be in from very fine uh, you know, secondary education, but has never had a bit of US history possibly. Right? You, you have to begin from wholly different premises, and it reminds you how to explain things in a way that many people who are in it all the time really forget. So I think it, it is an invaluable experience, those of you who are getting to study this subject here with this faculty are having, and, and I envy it. Sam, I'll save my comments about teaching outside the UK for a private conversation <laughs> between you and me, So because we don't have time now, but would be happy to talk about that with you. Uh, the conversation has morphed recently from culture wars and the battle over wokeness to the condition of higher education. And I think what has emerged is that the culture wars has to be put in a broader context of political economy and political battles over the future of the university. We got some very grim news from a few colleagues yesterday about what's happening at the University of East Anglia in terms of jobs being cut, and that's going to expand and and afflict uh, quite a number of other universities in the UK across the next few years. And it needs to be said that this is the fourth year of industrial action by faculty at universities in the UK with a resolution still not in sight. And so the, the, the questions uh, had that have come up about livelihood and livability of, of this uh, profession at this time I think those questions have um, been proposed to us with urgency and underscore the severity of the situation uh, and that it exists at all levels from graduate students up through faculty and beyond. Uh, it makes the continuation of the struggle extremely important. Just to bring us back to the culture wars by way of conclusion, uh, one of the questions that Nick put to me to put to the panel, which we didn't address. Finally, looking ahead to 2026, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, will Americans still be able to find common ground um, and a shared understanding of their past? Can the Declaration of Independence still serve as a unifying um, document? And the, the panel carefully um, uh, avoided that question in terms of answering it. And so I, I, I'll, the only thing I'll suggest by way of conclusion is the complexity of the issue by bringing Frederick Douglass 
back into the story. The, January, the July 4th oration is an extraordinary speech, uh, and it might lead you to the conclusion that Frederick Douglass thought that the Constitution, which was a slaveholding document in its origins, should be ripped up, and that the United States should start from scratch as a republic. But Frederick Douglass himself was a defender of that Constitution and said it must be reformed, not abolished. Uh, and I, so I leave you on that conundrum uh, of, um, of a man who saw the problem of race in America and it's all, in all its severity and complexity, and yet when push came to shove and when people were arguing, when Garrisonians were arguing for tearing up the Constitution, Frederick Douglass said, no, let's reconstruct it. So I leave that note for us to think about. I want to thank the panelists, and I ask the audience here to join me in thanking the panelists. And <laughs> and thanks to Nick and Jesus College and the University of Cambridge once again for allowing us to come together uh, for a, a, a very important series of conversations. Thank you.